All right, end of the day, stuck with us because of the snowstorm. Because I think this is the largest audience we can expect at 5 p.m. last day, right? Yeah. You, you have no place to go. Let's, let's get started because this is a short session. We'll zip through some of the slides because we want to really emphasize on the important ones. So as the intro say, we both work in Comcast. We're both working as uh, directors in data science engineering teams in the EBI, which is the Enterprise Business Intelligence. The next slide, I mean, you can find this later too. If someone wants to contact us, feel free. Uh, the agenda today is uh, some of the data science use cases. We're going to discuss what we really do at Comcast and then why we needed to build something like a data science as a service. Why couldn't we just do the traditional way of having uh, editors and whatnot? So we're going to cover step by step into our journey into this. Uh, so to start with our data, our data is, we have about 40 petabytes just in HDFS alone, and then few hundreds of terabytes in Teradata, along with uh, hundreds of Oracle servers, SQL servers, and people still have Excel spreadsheets somewhere. So what happens is that in order to process all this, we have to build on-prem cluster because Comcast, one of the things we do is not put the data out in the cloud yet. Not all the data can be put in the cloud, so we build this gigantic 1200 node cluster uh, in Hadoop and a lot of Spark there. You're talking at uh, peak time, you're using 25,000 cores using Spark 2.1. So that's the real powerhouse that we built. Uh, of course, we have the main purpose is to have lots of analytics and lots of models, hundreds of models. I think I counted over 600 models last time we checked. So it's a lot of models that we would need to build. And then uh, Shaker will cover some of the models that he's working on and uh, in general, categorize them better. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Sridhar, for the introduction. And uh, so, uh, as we know that we only have 30 minutes, so, uh, and 25 minutes for the session, five minutes for the Q&A. So I'll be going through uh, very, very quick, uh, quickly the, some of the very common use cases that we have in Comcast, uh, the data science use cases. And then, what are the challenges that we have faced, and uh, how did we solve it, uh, step by step? So as we all know that uh, there are tons of data science use cases, we, we all may be data scientists. And, um, but here, to name a few, we have few, churn, few data science uh, use cases here. Uh, to start with, uh, one of those are churn models where we try to identify where the customers are, uh, what is the probability of for, a, for a customer to churn. Then we have price elasticity, where we find the price reservation price for a product and for a customer. This is very, very big for retail industry because it gets combined with the direct mail optimization and campaigning. And uh, it is also used for coupons for the discount pricing. Then we also have geospatial route optimization. This is big for companies like um, FedEx, USPS, Uber, and also for Comcast because we also have tens of thousands of trucks uh, having the tech visit to the houses and we want to optimize the route uh, to maximize the profit. Then we have customer care analytics, we have video recommendations, we have voice recommendations and whatnot. So, I mean, we, we, we can see that we have tons of data science use cases, but there's one basic problem in all these um, solution if you want to build that in for the enterprise level, and that is we have massive amount of data, but still it's very difficult to stick those information to get some useful insights. And that is because of the lack of service level architecture, and that's what we are discussing in this session. So what I mean by the service level architecture is if you want to go into the data, inside the data, and want to see very, very quickly that what's happening in the data, what is there in the data, it will take a lot of time to write a lot of code, and then you have to be a good coder to do all those kind of things, visualization, so in, in the absence of this uh, service level architecture, it takes a lot of time to do something. And then second thing is, and I mean, I'm sure we have experienced this a lot among ourselves, that if we have the same data set and multiple teams and multiple people are using the same data set, then we have to start from the scratch. We ingest it, we process, we analyze. So we have to start from the scratch. All the teams, everyone will start from the scratch. And this will increase the development time of the solution. So what, what we need here is a central processing system having these characteristics. So let's discuss 
a very, very simple multivariate regression analysis for its churn models. Every data science problem and the solution is kind of a pipeline. So the pipeline starts with ingesting the data from, let's say, X sources, 10 sources. And then we join the data set to make it wide, the relevant columns. And then we do some outlier anomaly detection. We, um, if there is missing data set, then we impute, the, uh, impute some values to the missing data set. Then we want to find what columns are important. What are the features that are most important? What are the features that explains the variance the most? And then we find correlation. We do some advanced level feature engineering where we want to have some more information into the data set, right? And only then we jump on to the actual model building, whether it is regression or gradient boosted machine, supervised, unsupervised clustering. We work a lot with NLP, so whether it can be NLP. So only after that we uh, move on to the actual model building. After that, we do some cross-validation testing and the model is out for production. So this is a pipeline. Now just imagine that, let's say I want to jump into the stage two and then we'll, uh, I want to branch out another pipeline. So we have two pipelines now. And at the end of it, I want to destroy the second pipeline. But you as a, another data scientist working in a different team, you want to use the same data set. But you don't want to uh, reinvent the wheel and reprocess the data, redo the first three phases of the pipeline. You want to jump on the third phase of the pipeline, and then you branch another pipeline from there. But you don't want to destroy it. You just want to keep that. So right now, we have two pipelines in the same, using the same data set, solving two different problems. For example, just, just for example, this is not the actual case. Let's say you are doing some churn model for Boston and Philadelphia. And these are two different models. But the first few phases will be same for both the models. And then it's only the last few phases will be different. So why not we can do something like that? This will save a lot of time for the developers, data scientists, and, and everyone else. So keeping that in mind, we, we listed down some characteristic of the system that we want to build. The first thing is highly scalable. Obviously, we have tons of data, and we, we know that it's growing exponentially. We will have tons square of data next year. So it should be highly scalable. Then persisted and cached. Wherever it's necessary and needed, we have to persist and cache. Uh, the third thing, which is the most important thing, is SQL and the machine learning capabilities. So in each phase of the pipeline, we want the SQL capability. We want to query the data, the raw data, to see how the data looks like. In the second phase, we want to see what are the missing values and how it, it got imputed. So we, we want these SQL capabilities in the system. Obviously, we need the machine learning capabilities as well. But the most important point is multi-tenancy, as I discussed it earlier, that multiple people want to access the same data, maybe the raw data, and multiple people want to access the process data, so that they just want to start with the process data and build two different models. So multi-tenancy is one of the most important things. And the last important thing is access through APIs, REST APIs, and not only through languages. So what we build is, is a system called Sparkle. We have called it Sparkle. So Sparkle, you can access, and not only access, you can process, you can analyze data using languages like R, Python, Java, Scala. And not only through that, you can access and do every kind of stuff, all the cool kind of data science stuff using REST APIs. So that is the main thing that we want to hit it with this product, multi-tenancy and access through REST APIs. So keeping, keeping all these things in motivation, what, what we actually ended up building is a perpetual Spark engine, which is always available, always available. So this is something where, let's say you, you start a job, and uh, you don't know how many executors you want, how, many, how much of executor memory you need. So there's uh, some rule-based engine going be beneath it, and you, you, can, you can also give it, but by default, there's some rule-based engine which will determine how many executors you need, how much executor memory you need. Also, if it, if it sends that it cannot be done using a single Spark instance, it will spawn multiple Spark instance, because everything is based on ACA cluster, and each actor is uh, handling one Spark instance. So that is perpetual Spark engine, and uh, always available, and highly scalable, and scalable on demand. So these are the most important things. Uh, the characteristics that we have built for Sparkle. It, it also has to connect to various data sources, like uh, SQL, NoSQL databases, including Cassandra, HBase, Hive, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, um, Kafka, and Storm for streaming APIs, 
and then ORC, Parquet, Avro, and text files. And then we also have this role-based control on who can see what and who can use what. Let's say I can use the customer care data set, all the text data set, but you as my manager don't want me to access the pricing data set. So we can set all those as well here. And then it has the integration with H2O. So this is what we built. We call it Sparkle. And uh, I'll, I'll invite Sridhar to speak more about this. Thanks, Shekhar, that's for the wonderful introduction. So I'm going to cover basically into, uh, divvy up into the basics, and then we'll go into more technical items, and then we can take the questions later on. Uh, actually, any, every one of you here can build this, so it's not really rocket science. We took Spark, but we kind of cleverly packaged everything together, and so instead of Shaker and or me or some of the people who report to us or our peers, they don't need to start asking us the same damn question again. Like uh, the basic question that if I look at this one, this is the biggest problem always. Like people are like, okay, how do you connect to Elasticsearch? And then you have to start their tutorials and YouTubes and slide shares. You can do it. As I just said, it's not rocket science, but the amount of time you waste building each one of them and who's going to upkeep the versions. Elasticsearch, for example, changed quite a bit from 2.8 versions to 5.x. They completely changed the entire thing. Uh, Cassandra, same thing with every version, everything changes. So given that, what we wanted to do was to offload the data scientists from all this stuff, and we said we will do the whole thing, right? That I think we covered. Now let's look at it in internal things. Like how does this even work? How is it even possible? For uh, when I was a beginner, I was actually quite confused myself too. Like, okay, fine, I opened a shell, but then how is it actually doing everything? But once you got the understanding, you realize that Spark is a great computing engine. It's a great distributed computing engine, but the thing is underlying thing, you can still write pure Scala code and do everything you can possibly do in an old school system like a web service and anything else. So that's the uh, kicker. So that's where we started. We added Akka on it. We added Akka HTTP for APIs. Then we started adding REST APIs. So the interactions is purely through REST API as much as possible. We do not allow anyone to directly access it except the people who are maintaining it, which is our teams. Uh, the rest of the folks can uh, request some features, we'll add the features. So some of the cool stuff we'll see in the next few slides, we'll make you realize, and then we can come back to this if you want to uh, look at it more, because this little bit English we use there. So one, uh, some of the very important things we needed was the processor, which is the DAG, which is just Spark, there's nothing fancy there. Sparkle query language, which is an extension on top of the uh, SQL that Spark uses, in the essence that we kind of uh, put some placeholders in the language. It's not like you need to exactly type Spark. In that case, you don't need us. You can just do Spark SQL. Uh, but you'll see later on, actually, some, some phenomenal stuff we uh, innovated here. Especially, I'll, I'll show you how we translate from Python to Spark Scala. Uh, back into SAS and vice versa. We wrote a converter which automates up to 75%. Everything that you can throw at it, it just converts it. So you don't really need to spend that much time. So a SAS programmer can throw his SAS script, we convert that, and we push it to PySpark. So it's pretty nice that way. Otherwise, we'll spend years just converting everything from legacy systems. The other important things are the data quality checks. You must have data quality checks at scale. That's something that is overlooked pretty much a lot of places, they all focus on, I can process a petabyte, but who's doing the data quality checks? At some point, you need to know, uh, what are you really looking at? Is it something different? Is some trending going on there? So all, that also is built into Sparkle. So we can do massive number of complex trending analysis, histograms, approximate distance counts. You can look at all the statistical functions available in Spark data frame data set. We exposed everything in here. So in the essence, only thing you need to know is JSON. If you're good with JSON, you can hit this. You don't even need to know anything for basic stuff, right? So let's go to the next slide. So this is how it works. As I said, uh, it's an intelligent partitioning of all the data frames and data sets. Uh, we name every data frame and data set by a timestamp. It's like a classic Java program, but we are treating Spark as an underlying data structure for us or a data layer. So we are not really uh, exposing anything in Spark, so no one really knows what we were doing. They only know that they want to open a Parquet file, they want to open an ORC file, and they somehow want to join these two and then put it somewhere. That's it. And they can say just, can you put it in HBase? And we do that for them too. So it's a very nice thing. We had uh, dozens of people working on it. 
It's a wonderful uh, collection of uh, different mindsets and thought processes. We talked to uh, a few uh, folks here, including some of the vendors, about these ideas. So I think at some point they will incorporate some things like this. Uh, we haven't made it open source yet. We are still working through that. Like, we would like to, because there's nothing proprietary here. So a sample here, we should make it very clear. So this is a REST API call. And if you see that, uh, without looking too much into details, the key things are it is giving something called a start and end time. And then it has a complex rule set. For this, of course, you have to follow the documentation. But this is so advanced. What it does is it looks at billions of events within a time range, and it creates patterns of every single path in the customer journey where an escalation was followed by a customer support call. And then it also automatically checks. It's basically a pure time series anal analysis here. And this is arbitrary. You can put your own sequence. So everyone here can do hundreds of different paths like this. And that's all they need to know. And then this will generate you all the outputs. You can, you're querying time series now, which is not like a traditional database. So we exposed this. This is the first thing we did, actually. That's how it started the whole thing. And then slowly we started that, hey, let's expose more easier ones. The easier ones are like this. This is easy. This is really a piece of cake for us. So all we are saying is that, OK, we want to look at the Northeast division of Comcast. And then there's a, a return on marketing investment. And then some connects. So basically, there's something that's internal to Comcast. But you just hit this, and that's all you need to know. And so what happened as a result of this is a fascinating story. Uh, you will see the, the follow slides. This is just REST API, as I said. This is what we built. Uh, this is built by a UI team, and they had no idea about Spark, and actually it's not their job. So they took React.js, and then they lo looked at the APIs we provided, and they built this whole UI in less than three months. And this is directly in production now. Uh, there are dozens of people who are going to use this. This actually drives a lot of this campaign optimizations. So one example of this is it runs close to 600 different combinations in 10 seconds. That's the target for this. So how do they do it? Can they write all the Spark code and tune everything? No. So instead, they focus on the APIs like this. So they call these APIs for every single combination. It's much more advanced than that. They can write a lot of these filters, exclusions. Uh, they can use up to 175 variables for each API call. But once they wrote the React.js, which is JavaScript and HTML code, to create that payloads, which is REST API, Everything is just automatically refreshing there. And they concentrated on building this fantastic UI, which is mind-blowing. It's so fast. This is the other use case. This is customer journey analytics. We couldn't have done this without Sparkle, because the immense number of possible paths that we wanted to look at at the same time. And mind you, we are looking at over 10 years of data at this point for this. Because customer journey, we have to look at really, really long running, because Comcast is an old company. Uh, 10 years is something we're fairly normal for us to see what was the customer journey for 10 years, how has he progressed to up and down of the tiers, can we do something better, can we upsell, is something that we are not doing correctly. For this, it uses close to 600 different types of data sets or data sources. I didn't know that. I was shocked when I said 600. How can you have 600 data sets? So then they explained it to me that how Every system is so sophisticated, it generates its own data set. We are talking about modern signals, frequencies, you know, see the loss, truck rolls, uh, IVR calls where the interactive call went through, or maybe the agent answered it. And if the agent answered it, how did it get escalated? Or was it a building question, sales question? If there is a sales question, what happens nine months after that? So you have to look at like back and forth, plus or minus years. So. Using Sparkle, we were able to give the UI guys just the APIs. That's all they have, and they build this fantastic UI. So they have this uh, at the top. I don't know how well you can see it. There's some filters there at the top of the screen. So those are all the filters they put in the JSON request. They hit it, and you can do it. The next screen I'll show you is this. This is really fantastic. This is on top of Sparkle. This is a UI example. This is pretty much an exploratory UI we built. And this is using Sparkle internally. But the beauty was we were able to load and explore data sets very quickly just using Spark, nothing else. You can do it using notebooks also. So there's nothing against notebooks and others. But the only thing notebooks don't do is they don't let you play with the data like we can do here. If you see the next screen, you'll see that. 
We can play with the features. You can create features just using UI. You can play new things. And then you can, uh, even at the bottom, you see discretizers, the bucketizers, right, the quantile. And so various discretizers, various types of regression models, prediction models. You can play just using the UI. So not only did we start with the API, then we went on to build this. Now it makes it even more easier. So an executive or someone who is fairly technical but not a data scientist, he can actually play with this and see what is this data science all about. So you can just quickly run the models. But the beauty is that this is sharing the ecosystem with everything else. So a data scientist A, he said, hey, I figured this out. He'll give you the name, special identifier. You'll put the identifier here, and you can explore that same thing here. So you can validate and cross-validate and collaborate. And the another screen here, the, you saw this vector builder. And this is the magic. Uh, it's a converter. So it uses Scala program, uh, Scala ASTs. And uh, we also followed a lot of very good blogs by some very smart people. So finally, we ended up building it. This is not Antler. If uh, anyone is wondering, is Antler. Antler did not work for us. It was too complicated to add all the grammars we needed for the cross language back and forth. So instead, we just depend on Scala ASTs. And uh, so if you input SAS, it gives you Python Scala. Or if you can put Scala, it gives you the other ones. So it makes it easy for you to cross convert and collaborate. So we reuse and reuse all the talent that we have. You don't need to essentially replace everything. So that's why we did that. And uh, you want to cover? I mean, this is fairly technical one. So I think this is very, very basic. Everyone knows all this stuff. Yeah, we just have these slides at the end yeah. of the presentation because we thought we will hit some questions. Yeah, um, yeah. we have eight minutes for questions, I think. Yeah. Now we can cover in detail a lot of these questions. Like if you're wondering how did you build this or what, how you can build it yourself, any sorts of questions, we are open to it. We want to make it fast. I think we have made fast enough. <laughs> yeah, that's why we skipped. Faster than this. required. Slides, you can get it later too. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, the, uh, the cross language uh, you know, uh, conversion is, is absolutely fascinating. How accurate is it? Uh, meaning, you know, uh, you know, can I just take the code and, you know, that's... Uh, it's as good as my team and me. So right now it's at 70-75% uh, honestly. It's already automated. And uh, I, we keep playing with more scripts and we find new problems. Like some data scientist, he writes in a weird way and then we don't recognize that. So we do have things, but 70-75% is where we are now and it's Amazing considering how much time it saves you. So Indian, uh, this is also something we want to open source because this, I think it's a good thing to share the time we spent on this. Uh, I'm interested to know like, how do you guys build the data quality checks? Okay, data quality checks, you want to take it? Or? Yeah, sure. So data quality checks, it, it, it depends on the data and the type of things that you want to do. So for example, you want to, you want to ingest the chat data set and you want to check how much scripted language they have used. Or maybe you want to check some, some uh, table and want to check what are the missing values and uh, what kind of imputation you want to use that. So it's, it's basically, so everything that you're seeing on the, on the screen right now is like a big box repository, repository of methods, of functions, transformations, machine learning, SQL, everything. It's a like big box. And then when you come to use it, or process a data, then you will just pick and choose A, B, C, D, E, and then uh, you draw a line between that, and it will execute it. So data quality check is nothing but a set of rule engine, where you have been provided a lot of rules that you want to do. If you want, you can add those. If you want, you can use the default rules. I can add on a couple of things if you want. So the, some of the rules that we have is all JSON based, of course. So the rules are as simple as string length, e string, e int, e null, e float, e double, and then you can go to more complex like month or month histogram checks uh, beyond or below a threshold. So all this is JSONified. So you just specify as many rules as you want and assign it to a single column, or you can assign as many columns as you want to a single rule. So it's like a huge matrix x and y, and all this is just JSON. And as the Spark is progressing, like we were in Spark 1.6 when we started it, Spark 2 changed everything. Like data sets, data frames, they changed the underlying engine, the tungsten, and how well they do the binaries. And there's a lot of stuff now they push into the data frame or data set part rather than pulling everything. So the histograms and some of the advanced statistical models, there's a, 
uh, I think day and night difference between REDs and data sets. So we quickly latched onto that. So now we added a lot of this data set, exactly what you see in Sparkle Doc, we kind of replicated everything. So we have everything there. So for you, the rule actually t takes care of the entire thing. Like you can look, the uh, rule set that we run uh, comprises about 750 rules right now. It runs exactly on a 96 billion row table into 8,500 columns. So we run all the 750 rules and since it's Spark, it just does it. After a few hours, we have all the outputs and we index all the results as well as summary stats into Elastic Search Engine automatically. So we just go to Elastic Search Engine in the morning and we find all the results, what failed, what did not fail. Uh, it also includes a sample of what failed so that we can quickly look at the lineage and figure it out. We also have a lineage application in parallel to this which tracks how a column uh, gets uh, transitioned throughout the processing. Okay. Yep. You know, it looks pretty cool. How much time and money you spent on this and when it will be available for us? All right, so how much money? So talking about Comcast scale or? <laughs> yeah. It actually was uh, relatively cheap. I think uh, total number of people who worked on it was about six or seven, that's it, including us. So it was pretty lightweight. I think we spent more hours outside work and we, we took it personally, so we just spent our time. So I think it took about three months for the first cut to actually start working. Because initially it was like, we made so many mistakes. I, we took spot context, we tried to cache it, this and that, and then slowly we figured out, oh, that won't work, this won't work. So it was a big mystery to us. So we learned a lot because we started when 1.6 was out. And now we are much better, so it's faster. So the open source pack, we are actually talking to people. We are saying there's absolutely nothing IP in here. I think people can use it, contribute, or if there's something better that comes along, in fact, we will use it too. It's okay. So uh, let's see. Maybe in a few months they will agree to that. I mean, we, they, we have to clean up some code, actually. I think that's one of the things in open source, and our code is not that beautiful. You'll see my name somewhere in comments. <laughs> yeah. How does uh, Sparkle relate to, say, Livy? with regard to persistent Spark context and being able to run arbitrary Scala or Python. Um, is it purely REST API based where you have to pass in all those parameters or could you also run arbitrary code of any nature and how does it handle batch? Lots of stuff related to Libby. You can actually execute entire scripts or programs. You just need to, uh, the question was like, how can you execute other scripts and programs rather than JSON? Because JSON means something that we know, no one else knows and if some X feature not, does not exist, is that limiting you? No, you can also attach a script at the end. So you can attach Python R or Scala, uh, Scala program. It'll actually execute on the data set. So basically internally what happens is we consider it as uh, all the stages that you typically do, we consider that in JSON. So you can start with the input set and you can say output set and you can have as many stages as you want and you can cache it. But at any point of time you think that these guys did not do a good job, you can simply say, execute this uh, UDF, you can call it. Use a defined function, it will execute that because we are simply running in the Spark environment, we can run anything that Spark can run. Does that answer your question? But uh, I understand the other question was the, uh, you said Lily, right? So yeah, we, we talked to those uh, people, some of the people from Cloud Era last year itself and we decided that even though it's a great platform. We tried to use it initially. We also tried to use the Spark job server someone put on GitHub. But for our use case, we needed a little more control, uh, for especially role-based access control. Sparkle doesn't let you see the data you're not supposed to see. So even though you're you latched onto the system, you can use everything. Maybe uh, you only have access to 50% of the columns of the data. That's all you'll see. So those are the things that the other uh, open source tools do not have yet. So. We just went ahead to that. And the other beauty behind Sparkle is not just data analysis and quality. We also have absolute 100% integration with Spark ML. That means as you're progressing, you can say, hey, run logistic regression, done, piece of cake. There's nothing else you need to do, no import, export. It runs inside, it's in memory. By that time, data set is in memory, so it's lightning fast after that. Right, so next question. I would like to share one more thing, which uh, we are adding one more building block to the feature engineering. And this is um, in progress. So what happens is this, this will only work for supervised classification models. We, we have certain columns, but there are certain things that are missing in the, missing information in the columns, which doesn't correlate directly with the target variable, let's say. So for example, sometime back we had this, 
I, I can see the time. Yeah. <laughs> so some time back, we had this Kaggle competition where we have to predict how many people were, or who got rescued in Titanic when the Titanic sank. So there, if you just omit, if you just uh, remove the column of gender, your prediction will be very, very bad. It, it will be very, very bad, because we all know that all the female got pref preference and they got rescued. So what, what are we doing here is, uh, you give a column and we will see what kind of data set it is. Uh, string, numeric, float, double. And if it is string, then we do some entity tagging. So let's say if it is a person or company or, or what is it. And then we have tons and tons of like hundreds of thousands of functions that is still in progress though. But we have uh, tons of function that will apply to all those columns and then see using the new column what is the info gain related to the target variable. So even if you have omitted the column of gender, you just have the name, you have the probability value associated with the gender of this person name being of male or a female, and then use that column and the accuracy will be like very, very high. So this is some advanced feature engineering uh, blocks that we're adding to Sparkle. It's, it's in progress. All right, and that's all the time we have for questions. I'm sure Shekhar and Sridhar would be happy to talk to you in the back of the room. Uh, the next session will start in, at this point, about nine minutes. We have nowhere to go because of the snow, so <laughs> <laughs> right here. <laughs>